Check one, two, sound check. Here we go. Thumb up. Oh, that's a hardness of the heart problem you have. Hardening of the attitude. Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, we'll start uh, sort of at the beginning part of this. I'd started last Sunday night. It had been a while on a Sunday night since we had been together. And uh, so anyway, we talked about the sweet smelling savor. And uh, Lindsay was having problems getting those sermons um, rendered for some reason. Her software kept crashing. Because I really was going to tell her that I wanted Sunday nights to be called uh, a, skunk in, a skunk and a cigarette. Or it's not a skunk, it's not a cigarette or something like that. And if you saw what I preached on last Sunday night, you get that, you understand it. But anyway, uh, we're going to move on from there and talk about some uh, somewhat uncomfortable things simply because of the times that we live in. And um, just how true the Bible is um, in, in naming what, it, what really is the main problems in this world. Um, a video came across my feed on YouTube. To, uh, I watched it this morning. And uh, it is very, very true. Uh, somebody made a, a, it's a short video and they interviewed people on the street in St. Louis, downtown and in the various neighborhoods and asked them, uh, in your opinion, is St. Louis one of the most dangerous cities in the country? And everybody he interviewed said it is the most dangerous neighborhood or city in the entire country. Uh, one guy said he had been robbed on the Metrolink twice. Once they stole his bike. The next time they stole his wallet. And he said there's literally nothing you can do about it because these thugs... They'll gang up and they'll come against you and there's no way you can fight a gang. And uh, somebody asked him uh, or asked somebody else, uh, does everybody in St. Louis have a gun? And he said, yeah. And he said, the, the grown-ups, uh, we know how to use them. And he said, we know... Um, that 
in, I'm going to take it in the context that it's in. He said, we know uh, how to shoot them. And that, that is, we know that you only shoot, you only shoot what you aim at. You only aim at what you're going to shoot. And he said, the younger, the youth of this city, they all carry guns, but they don't care who they hit. They just, they're killing kids and killing everybody else. And, um, and you have to ask the question, uh, number one, how did they get there? Number one, the number one reason is the churches are Christless. The churches are without the true Jesus Christ. That's part of it. The other part is, is governmental. Uh, the people of St. Louis, or maybe this was done without them, but they elected people in St. Louis to run St. Louis that are the reason why the problem exists. We know Kim Gardner was part of the problem. Very serious situation when you cannot have law and order in a town. The police, doesn't matter how many people they arrest, none of them, none of them are even going to trial, much less see prison time. And when you fill the streets with people like that, um, when, um, the various leaders, uh, whether it's the mayor, uh, the city council or whoever it is, when they, when they spend more money on government handout programs than they do law enforcement, you're going to have problems. And so... It was like a smack in the face to St. Louis, uh, which at one time the downtown area was a nice place to go. If you want to go to a ball game or anything like that, you go. But now it's getting too dangerous. And uh, I won't go up there until they at least start making valid attempts at cleaning that up a little bit. But that's, that's just the sign of the times that you and I are living in. Paul e explained this to Timothy and told him that this is going to happen. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. And that's a problem that we have today. So it's, it, it's our religious leaders. And you know what? When Paul said men shall be lovers of their own selves, he meant that in a negative way. That men should not be lovers of their own selves. And yet you have Joyce Meyer telling everybody that the only way to love your neighbor as yourself is you have to learn how to love yourself. And no, everybody's got a good, firm grip on loving themselves. Their problem is that they love themselves too much. And uh, it's ridiculous. So when you get it from the religious leaders, then you get it from the politicians, the people in charge... Uh, and the people know what's going on on the streets. They know that it's too dangerous to walk up and down the street. They know it's too dangerous to ride to Metrolink. They know it's too dangerous to go shopping in certain places or go to their favorite nightclubs or whatever. They know it's too dangerous. Taking their life into their own hands. It didn't used to be that way, but it's that way. And uh, it will probably get worse before it gets better. Uh, it'll get better when Jesus comes back. Amen. First thing he's going to do is shut all the nightclubs down. Amen. All right. Ephesians chapter 5. Be ye therefore followers of God. As dear children. Look at that phrase. Dear children. That ought to bless you. That's a father. Or a mother who looks down at their child and smiles. And the child wonders what the mom or the dad is smiling about. And mom or dad just say, oh, I just love you. We can't even express in words the deep feelings that we have toward our own children. But they're dear. And God has called us dear children. And that's something. 
He can't even explain or express to us just how deep his love is to, toward us. But he gave signs of it, like giving Christ to this world. God commended this love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and so on. But anyway, uh, verse 2, walk in love as Christ also has, has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. That's where we were getting at last week. Um, by the way, I didn't even mention the wood. Uh, I love the smell of a wood fireplace. A fire burning in a wood fireplace. That, I love that smell. And um, uh, I tell you, back in a time, <laughs> uh, in days where people didn't take daily showers to clean their body off, uh, the only thing they had going for them at the time was the sweet smell of the fireplace that existed in their home that they covered up the scent of their own body filth. Um, I think the fire, I think the fireplace helped them out a lot on that. Okay. I think the smell of the wood smoke got getting on them and on their clothes made them smell better. There's something about a good fire that smells good. We like to build fire pits at home. When we go camping, what's the best part about camping? Building a fire, build a fire and roast marshmallows and and hot dogs and everything else in it and just sit there and smell the fire smell it but then he said um, verse 3 but fornication all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints nor filthiness nor foolish just nor nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient but rather the giving of thanks let's pray father we ask your blessings on your word tonight Bless your people and bless this time that we have spent with you, Lord. Let it not be in vain, but Lord, open your, uh, open your mouth and speak to us, God, what you would have us know on the inside of our heart. Apply it to our hearts, God. Write it in our hearts that we may live by it from this day forward, we ask in Jesus' name and amen. And so, uh, let's see, that's the sweet-smelling savor, that's the ram, um, Let's see here. I'm trying to remember how far I got last last week. Um, yeah, I did that. Second Corinthians chapter two, where we always triumph in every place. I like that. We are unto a God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved, in them that perish. Christ was the high priest, and he had the the smell of the ointment on him. He had the smell of the incense on him, and uh, when God sees us uh, he smells his only begotten son jesus christ because we are in him and he in us um, now let's deal with this for a minute verse three fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish jesting, or foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now let's let's run through uh, something. What he said here, I made. My note. Well, I don't have my notes in here. Where are my notes? I just had notes that I put in here. Hang on a second. Let me see if I have an update here. What day is the day? Yeah. I just made updates to this and they're not showing up. Oh, well. All right. What I did was where it says fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness. Let's talk about those for a minute. Find out what they are. Um, the fact that he put fornication and all uncleanness together, I think 
God is spelling out to us, making it easy for us to understand what he's talking about. Because some people, and I ran into this one time, some people split hairs on, on this issue. In other words, they stick with a definition of a word that benefits them it doesn't condemn them even though they're guilty of some pretty rotten things. I had a man, uh, he was just passing through. And I don't know how he had heard of me, but this was before I started doing the Watchmen and putting everything online. He, he came by here and uh, he may have seen one of the Prophecy Club videos, I don't know, but anyway... He had come from Texas, from a Church of Christ church, or no, a Nazarene church. Nazarenes believe in instant sanctification. They believe that once you bow and give your life to the Lord, you are instantaneously changed, transformed in every way, and you no longer have fleshly no longer sin, you no longer either sin by commission or sin by omission, uh, that it is impossible for you to sin, and that's their doctrine. And the Nazarenes are like the first cousins to um, the United Methodist and other Methodist groups, better than others, uh, in that they're based upon um, the teachings, the doctrine of the Wesley brothers, John Wesley and what was it, Charles Wesley? Uh, they were brothers, and uh, they they're the ones who started this movement. There is a, a Pentecostal branch of this called the uh, Wesleyan Holiness, and um, that revival that took place in Kentucky. Um, was a Wesleyan school of theology. Uh, so I'm not sure if all Wesleyan groups teach the same thing, but I know that the Nazarenes teach that once you get saved, you are, you are complete and you are perfect and you do not sin any longer. So this man, he is a few years older. He's probably my age now. Um, he was probably in his 50s. Um, he had been pretty much run out of his church and run out of his own house because his wife, and this was a fairly good sized church, and the pastor had a son in that church, and that son, he was an adult, and the idea was, everybody knew it, that when the old pastor died or when he retired, then his son would take over in his footsteps. And so what's going on behind the scenes is, and this man's telling me this with tears in his eyes. He's saying that when he would go to work, oftentimes that pastor's son would come over to his house. And be there with his wife alone. And I'm not going to describe uh, any of the things that he told me they did. But when he found out about it, he felt a responsibility to bring it up to the pastor. And um, the pastor wanted to just kind of sweep this under the rug and... Not make an issue about it. But that wasn't satisfactory because this man's saying, look, I'm getting kicked out of my own house here. And while you may say that the things they did don't actually qualify as the act of adultery. I'm telling you, it was. And he said, I can't. My wife now has no love for me at all, has no affection for me at all. 
She doesn't want forgiveness from me because she's not sorry that she did. So effectively, I can't live in my own house anymore. So he quit his job. He, he had to take what he could get and move. He was moving up north. And I asked him, I said, so how does that work now in a Nazarene church where they believe in instant sanctification, that this man would not have done this if he had been truly sanctified by God and without sin. And the guy knew exactly what I was asking and knew exactly what I was talking about. And he knew that it was all a big lie, it's a big cover up. And he said, they just say that, oh, what so-and-so did, that what really wasn't a, a, a sin. That really wasn't a, a violation of God's word. And when they had a trial of that pastor's son in that church, that was the decision that was made by whoever, I don't know if the elders or the people or what, was that since what they were doing didn't quite qualify as the act of adultery, then therefore no wrongdoing was committed, no sin was committed, therefore he remained sinless, he will remain in his position, and boom. That's it. No repentance, no I'm sorry's, none of that, because if you repent, that's an admittance that you know you did something wrong. And we can't have that because we have to maintain this this picture, this seen in front of everybody that we, since we're Nazarene and we believe in sanctification, that we are perfect and that we do not sin. I'm here to tell you, it counts. When he said fornication and all uncleanness, I guarantee you, based on what the man told me, they were 100% guilty of uncleanness. 100% guilty of it. 100% guilty of covetousness. Why? Because out of God's mouth proceeded, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And that is exactly what this soon-to-be pastor, he's going to take over daddy's empire, and rule the church. It's exactly what this man was guilty of. He was guilty of covetousness before he was guilty of anything else. And all of them are together. So with fornication. Fornication, I believe, is the adulteration. And that word adulteration means corruption of or um, oh, I don't know any, any other words to say. But basically you have taken um, the adult, you've taken the act, the marital act, and you have adulterated it. You have turned it into something that it was never ever intended to be. By God, by your wife, by your vows, it was never intended to be that way. You have adulterated your, your marriage and the vows that you have taken and the things that you have done. So, the issue of fornication and all uncleanness, I believe, includes the act of adultery uh, with a married person. A married and an unmarried person or two unmarried persons or two married persons or anything beyond that. Um, that falls in that category of fornication and all uncleanness. Um, covetousness, the lust of the eyes falls into that category when men look upon women or young ladies, and work out in their mind, that's uncleanness. And God knows it. God knows it's unclean. God knows it's wickedness. 
uh, any any kind of act of fornication on anyone aside from your God-given spouse. Um, sodomy. Homosexuality. What Paul mentioned in Romans chapter 1. Men with men, working that which is unseemly. Even the women changing the natural use of their bodies. All of those things are covered under this fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. All of that is covered under these three words, I believe. Okay? The marital act should remain inside the marriage. Not anywhere else. It doesn't belong. Even if you want to, this pastor out in Oklahoma got his head blown off from the boyfriend that his wife invited into their marriage acts. I don't, I don't know what this man, this pastor was thinking. I don't know what was going on in his head. That made him think this he could get away with this and it would be all right. But that's what he did. And when the wife said to the boyfriend, oh, my husband's mean to me. He's bad. Oh, he's terrible. Oh, I, I wish I could get rid of him. And will you do it for me? So she gave the guy her husband's gun, waited for the, the pastor to come home from a missionary retreat and um, that night she left the back door open and uh, I think she was sleeping in another room with their kids or something like that and the guy walked in and blew his brains out and uh, they they nailed it didn't take them long for it to figure out that she was part of it and it didn't take them long to figure out what all was going on either uh, that's not, that's not how I want to die. Amen. That's not how I want to leave this world. Uh, I don't want anybody to have to question in their mind where, where did, where did, I wonder where Pastor Mike went. I don't want that. I want everybody to know 100%. And I know that that's my responsibility. That's my responsibility to make sure that I go to heaven like I'm supposed to. And that people know it. Okay, it's not anybody else's. You don't have to, I don't want you to have to cover for me or anything. I just want to let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So anyway, let it not once be named among you as becometh saints. This is not comely for us. This is not something that looks good when we do these things. It, it makes us look dirty and defiled. But then look at what he says in verse 4. Neither filthiness. And he puts it in the context of foolish talking. Nor jesting. So. The. Telling of. Filthy jokes. Truck stop jokes. Job site jokes. Jokes that people learn. Hanging around other people. The retelling of those jokes. Um, all of that is not comely for us as Christians to be doing those things and then try to convince people. Uh, so filthy talking, that would include curse words, I believe. Uh, let's do this. Let's, let's make a covenant with our mouth that we'll be the only people in Jefferson County who don't use the F word every three words in a sentence. With some people, it's not possible. I grew up 
in the 70s, but still in the early 70s, you, there were things you just didn't say in front of children. And um, shows that you didn't watch. Things that uh, even adults, if adults did some of these things or whatever, they knew that it wasn't good for their children to learn it. My daughter showed me a video the other day of an African-American woman, and I'm not, it could have been a white woman for all I care, but she put her phone in the bathroom, turned it on and recorded, and she told her four or five children that she's going to walk out of the room, and then while the door's closed, they can say whatever dirty word that they want to say. Yes? Yeah, I, I figured that out. It's a trend, and these children are saying words that I got my mouth washed out with soap for. And um, it was young children, too. Young children. Okay? As young as JR. No. And then, then, the, the video that she showed me, right after that, another Amer African-American woman told her son, son, I'm going to put the phone down here, and I'm going to walk away, and you can say whatever you want to say. You can say whatever dirty word you can say. You want to say every cuss word, whatever. So the young man stood there. He must have been about 10 years old, something like that. And mama walked off, and... She sped the video up because the boy just kind of stood there like this. Never said a word. Mom comes back in about nine, five, six, seven, eight minutes, something like that. And asks him, you know, I gave you the opportunity to do this. Why didn't you say anything? And this young boy said, because, Mom, even though you weren't here to hear them, God was. Amen. And I went, Woo! Amen! Amen. And listen, that's a, that's a mother who has taught her son that listening to that ghetto music is wicked. It is defiled. What was the first sign that Moses figured out something was going on down in the camp of the Israelites when he come down from Mount Sinai the first time. What well, was the first sign that he figured something's going wrong here? The sounds, the music. The drums, the beat, and everything else. And who was it Moses was it Moses that said sounds like the sound of war? And I'm telling you, it is. There is a battle and a warfare going on over those who are the gatekeepers of the content that goes into our children's minds, their ears, their eyes. And listen, it don't. It won't take you long if you'll if you'll do a little search. You'll find these top singers admitting in interviews that they know for a fact that a spirit enters into them when they perform. They know it. Um, oh, who's that guy? He was a folk singer. Who am I trying to think of? Huh? Not John Denver. Well, John Denver had his own problems. John Denver... Uh, was a student of a man by the name of Werner Erhard who started Erhard Seminar Training. And Erhard was teaching people like John Denver and others that they can eventually become a god. And he, John Denver, in a, I think it was a Life Magazine interview they did with him when he really rose to fame, he, he admitted, he said, I believe that I will become a god one of these days. 
That's what Denver said. Uh, huh? No. Um, well, he, yeah. Uh, Johnson, he was like the father of, of blues, rhythm and blues. And he used to try to play with these guys up on the stage. And they said, get out of here. You, you're terrible. You don't, know, you don't know how to play guitar. He went into a place. It was a crossroads. And he stood there at night, made a contract with the devil. The devil would give him abilities that nobody else had and would give him uh, fame and fortune, give him the ability to play blues guitar. And all of a sudden, three months later, four months later, he shows back up. He's got a guitar that's different. He added a seventh string to his guitar. Is there six or five? He added a new string to his guitar so he could play things that nobody had ever heard played before. And everybody's like, how in the world do you play this thing? And he, he admitted, Robert Johnson's his name. He said, I made a deal with the devil. And he sang about it in one of his songs. By the way, he's the one that started the 27 Club. Rock stars who die at 27. Okay? Uh, Janis Joplin. Jimi Hendrix. Um, Robert Johnson. 27 years old. Huh? Yeah, Jim Morris. Uh, yeah, Morrison from the doors. He died at 27. Now, all of these rock stars that die mysteriously at uh, Amy Winehouse, 27 years old. Kurt Cobain, 27 years old. They all die at 27 years old. They sold their soul and the devil came to, re to claim it during that 27th year. I don't know what the deal is with that. Other, there's a link maybe to the New Testament, something like that. But anyway, that's how, that's, that's how it was done. But there was a folk singer from the 60s. I can see his face. He was popular. Anyway, he supposedly, in like the late 70s, supposedly became a Christian. Supposedly. But then he's doing, here in the last few years, he's doing a 60 Minutes interview. And he is admitting that he made a deal with the powers that be. To have success and fame and fortune and all that stuff. Traded in his soul. He said, I'm just keeping up my end of the bargain. They want to know how he had lasted this long. Uh, if I named the name, you'd know it right away. I can never think of the guy's name. Um, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Huh? Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. Snoop Dogg, same thing, made a deal with the devil. And um, that's filthiness. To listen to that music is pure filthiness. Uh, Edward, Edward Bell, the week after Ferguson and the Mike Brown deal. I was just, I was just asking for testimonies from people. Ed Bell stood up. And he said, I just want everybody to know, he said, the reason why that happened had very, very little to do with the police. It had everything to do with, number one, how children are raised in our area. They're raised, they are taught from birth to don't trust white people, don't trust police officers, hate them, despise them. Call them racists for doing their job. And then he said they hear it from their, from their single parents house. Where they're being raised by their grandma because their mom and dad's in jail. Or their dad's dead. And they're being raised in single parent homes without a father. And by the way, it works both ways. It works that way in white houses too as it does black houses. It's the same problem. And people let their kids listen to that filthy junk. And he said it. He said they're, they're told in their music to grow up to be cop killers. And he said, I won't let my boys listen to that junk. They're not listening to that music. And uh, I'm just going, can't believe he's saying this. But I'm glad he is. But he said, that's the whole problem right there. 
And he said, they'll make it into anything else except it's their own fault. And I'm just, wow. So filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, foolish jesting, filthy jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Instead of you trying to be the dirty talker all the time to make everybody think that you're in with them. Boy, you're, you're just in a league with them because you say all the cuss words and you pass on all the dirty jokes and you laugh at the ones that they're telling. Boy, you want to be in with these guys. You want them to like you. And that, yeah, that sounds like junior high school stuff, but it, it goes on way up into 50s and 60 year olds still trying to be part of something. So they take on this filthy talk and foolish talk, jesting, making fun of people all the time. Uh, tearing people down and acting like it's funny. I've seen sermons given by supposedly fundamental King James only pastors that were nothing but jesting messages where they were trying to be funny for an hour and 15 minutes by bragging about something that they did or bragging about uh, how many people they run out of their church because they weren't acting right and living right and so on and then make a big joke about it. And I can tell you that as a pastor, when people leave, I don't joke about it. it makes me weep. But um, that stuff goes on a lot. And what it is, it's just the, the it's, it's foolish pride inside of a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist or whoever. And uh, you hear them talk about how they had a backdoor revival. Why, we run off 35 people out of our church. And boy, I tell you what, now, now we're really living right. One, one pastor, a, a family called me and said that their pastor basically was dividing up the church, almost like Jesus. That he had, he said this in a Sunday morning sermon. That all of the people sitting on the front four rows... Those were the true saints of God because they'll be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meeting. They'll come to all these meetings. But then you get to the back four rows and those are the people that uh, they're only going to come once a week and they won't have near the power with God that the rest of us. Have. And he just basically split the whole church up. By and he did it publicly, and I just don't know how people take that kind of stuff, but but that's what he did, and uh, that kind of talk, that kind of foolish talking, is not comely for the pulpit of God. It's not, but rather the giving of thanks is I'm thankful that God saved me I can't brag about it because I didn't do it but God did and I'm thankful that he did so be thankful people spend your time being thankful instead of trying to be in with everybody and talking like they're talking and doing what they're doing and young people um, when you're around other young people, don't, don't follow their stuff. Don't do it. Because it'll get you in a world of trouble that may not leave you for the rest of your life. Okay? Let's stand and be dismissed tonight. Appreciate you all coming.